Hey, welcome back to the shop. My name is John, and today I am answering your questions that you gave me on our most recent videos, how I earned 100K a year by making this fixture, and teaching you how to make $1,000 a day. Since those titles were pretty clickbaity, let me just make myself perfectly clear. I am not asking you for anything. I'm exchanging this information with you for free. I ask that you approach it like that, not that I'm hiding anything. But if you want what I was saying you could have in those last two videos, then I encourage you to stick around and check this out. I'm also going to be revealing my number one favorite tool in the shop everybody asks about and people who come into the shop and see me using it also ask me about. All right, let's get into the questions. The question is, what welder are you using? I use this Lincoln Square Wave 175. I bought this used over 10 years ago when I started in the trade. This was my first welder. If you're just getting started, any welder is the correct welder to be using. Buy anything you want off of Amazon. Another great option is buying Everlast welders. They're, green, they're like a bright lime green. A lot of pro fabricators are using those and they're about half the price of uh, red Lincoln stuff and blue Miller stuff. This is about as simple as a welder can get. There's just basically a big knob for amperage and that's it. These go for sale for maybe a thousand bucks used on Marketplace or uh, Kijiji, Craigslist, whatever. So. Keep your eye open, you can pick one of these up easy. Just curious where you didn't buff the weld discoloration prior to shipping. I know it's a manifold and it gets hot all that. Okay, the person asking the question is completely correct. In the commercial world, it would be a travesty, a sin, to send something out that had weld color on it. But for some reason, in the performance automotive world, weld colors and weld beads sell manifolds. I, I can't explain it, it's just how it is. People do not want you to wash those off. They want to see them, they want to show their friends. Um, I've never had any ill consequences from that. It's never been a problem, but you are correct that um, most of the time they should be cleaned off. And when I do commercial work around here, I would never leave the welds on like that. That'd be just an uh, amateur move. You need more videos like this explaining what rod you use and your method. It's a really subjective question, but on anything 304 stainless steel, I use a 309 rod. You can use 308 or 309. You need to understand this metallurgy and what you're welding. Uh, don't take my advice on it. Look it up properly. Great video. Are you using a foot pedal? I'm a bit of a princess with welding. I'm used to welding clean parts on a clean bench in a perfect position uh, with the air conditioning on. I do prefer using a thin little torch. This is a CK130 torch. For actuation, I don't like using the button, the slider on here. That's not really my jam. I just use a simple foot pedal. Back in the day, if I was doing a roll cage or something else where I was TIG welding in a ridiculous position, I'd put the pedal between my legs and just do a bit of a dance. It's such a personal question. Everybody has their own way. Find what's best for you, but you're really not gonna have any trouble in this industry using a pedal. Sick, dude. Just curious, not a performance guy. Why do these manifolds need full pen? Okay, so why do you want a full pen weld? Well, you want this all to become one tube. You don't want it to be two tubes with a passive weld on top of it. Heating and contracting is your biggest enemy with manifolds, and your car will actually do hundreds, thousands of cycles. Different thicknesses of pipe will have different expansion rates. So if you just put a bead of weld on top of this, you've got a really, really thin band-aid of metal, a, a thin strip of glue. You can call it on top of this thing and as this expands and contracts that weakest point is going to be taking up the majority of that expansion and contraction. If you bevel this even better than what's there and you get a hundred percent penetration you now have a weld that's as thick as the wall of this pipe. Definitely strive for full penetration and back purge all of your welds no exceptions. What is your preferred tungsten for manifolds? can't really answer that question for you. It's, it's too subjective. I have a transformer style welder. Most new welders are inverter style and they like different tungstens. I was using the red in 330 seconds. That's the, the size I like most. A couple years ago, I switched to the 2% lanthanated. That is uh, non-radioactive. So there's radioactive dust that comes off of these red ones when you're grinding them only. And uh, I just thought, man, if there's a way that I can avoid that, that's better. I actually like its properties better. It's a little bit more tough. Could you do this with MIG too? Your welds look great, but I only have MIG. Could I get the same result? Nice, oh, that's such a good question. This person is thinking about starting where they stand. They're not letting something that they don't have get in the way of what they want. That is the key to success, or at least one of them. You could make my exact manifold with a MIG welder and really have no issues. Basically, the TIG welder does a little bit more reaching. 
and, and you're gonna struggle a little bit with a MIG welder to get the finesse. On Instagram, I was following a guy who was machining 6B Cummins turbo manifolds that were machined billet, so out of steel on each side, and then he put them together, and then he would do a MIG weld around the entire thing. They looked beautiful. He made it look like MIG welding was the only way to build those manifolds. So yes, you can start right where you stand today. Did you go to welding school or just buy a welder and send it? This is a great question. Uh, no, I did not go to welding school. I have zero education past high school. I learned welding at a small shop I worked at and they used welding to solve problems for them at this machine shop. It was just kind of a tool in their toolbox. They weren't welders. So I picked up the skill there. But let me tell you what the secret is for learning how to weld. And I, I believe that any welder you ask, they will give you this answer. It's just seat time. I can't think of a time where having a great teacher isn't the best thing ever. Is it needed? No, not at all. And you can jump on Weldmonger YouTube channel, look up at the welding tips and tricks video on it, and uh, really you'll be learning from the master of the masters on welding. So I don't think school is necessary. I certainly don't want it getting in your way of starting where you stand and being able to just get into the industry and start. I get the table works as a big heat sink. My question is, was there much contortion from the heat since it wasn't clamped down during final welding? The biggest thorn in the side of any welder is warpage. I learned a long time ago from an old guy at a shop, no matter what you do, when you're welding, thick steel, it's going to warp. Warping with welding is something that's only managed. It's not mitigated totally. Big fat heat sinks help. This table actually doesn't act as much of a heat sink. Sometimes I do clamp things to this table. It's not very flat. It's really not the best way to do it. Its main job is to stop things from scratching up. If it's going to warp, you fabricate it in a way where it will warp into the shape that you want or into the position that you want. Probably a dumb question, but what's a good way to mock up the bends lengths you need to then base the fixture off of? When you are building a jig or building a product for a car, it will pay you dividends constantly to make it out of standards, standardized things. 45 degree and 90 degree bends are standardized. Really, you can make it like just having to throw Lego in. A lot of my jigs uh, are from before a time where I understood that. Consistency will save you time, a ton of time, and then you'll be able to just have a little material list. And every time you sell one of these products, because I hope you have a ton of products that you're selling, you won't stress out every time you sell one of these products. I think the hardest, most tedious part is actually designing and jigging. You kind of glossed over that. <laughs> but I guess you gotta keep some of the sauce secret. <laughs> yeah, I'm not keeping anything secret. It's just that uh, I'm not a great explainer of uh, how to do. As far as making the jig, um, yeah, I think that's a separate video. Maybe I'll need to jig something and make a video because uh, just as I'm thinking about explaining it, yeah, it is kind of complex. I just use muffler clamps to, to make my jig. They dropped right in place. It's not the perfect situation because they're mild steel and I'd much prefer not having mild steel touch stainless. Really, the more I think about it, I just have to make a video on jigging. Stay tuned in the next couple weeks. I'll, I'll likely put something together and uh, I'll show you a simple process of jigging. That die grinder you're using to deburr is the cat's meow. Any chance on sharing the make and model and what, kind, what bit you use? I love this question because I believe that this is the most valuable tool in my shop. When I first discovered these, I didn't know how people lived without them. And that is a pencil grinder. This is called an NSK Impulse. It's an NSP601. There are many inexpensive versions of this. One of these is the brand name, and one of these is just the uh, junky one from Princess Auto. Maybe if this is all you can afford right now, sure. Pick one of these up, it'll, it'll get some of the job done, but I highly recommend one of these. They spin so much faster. Their, their spindle bearings are so much better. It just leaves a nicer finish, and it's just so nice. This cord works great. All you need to do is keep your eyes on eBay for these. They come up all the time. I highly recommend picking one up for cheap, and if it needs bearings or it needs a rebuild, no big deal. Put the money into it, and you'll have a grinder for life. These are so awesome. Air regulator is nice if you want to slow it down for certain jobs. You absolutely need an oiler on here. The level of quality of this tool isn't something you just oil every now and then. You oil it constantly during use. So these are inexpensive, these oilers. Pick one up, filter your air, and this will last forever. As far as the bits I'm using, there's lots to choose from, but I am just using this single cut 
round nose carbide burr. These are inexpensive. Uh, I get these on McMaster cars. Single cuts leave a very nice finish. The double cuts don't as much. They leave a burr on each side. I'm just not a fan. If you get yourself one of these, you will be a happy camper for a very long time. And all sorts of people will ask you about where you got these, because that is a very popular question on this channel. If it's the same kit every time, I could see a world where 3D printed guides that each pipe slides on would be useful for tacking. I know this isn't a question, it's a statement, and that is awesome. That's why I'm highlighting it here. This person is 100% correct. They're on the gold right now. I would propose 3D printing two halves, two clamshells. They go together, and that's where you mark the pipe, and then you just cut it. I see a lot of guys making the jig, so they actually just have to clamp it inside of their bandsaw and then just make the cut on the jig rather than marking it first. I know many fabricators who have bought 3D printers just for that use, myself included. It's a nasty good tool for being able to do that. You could technically 3D print your entire manifold, dimensionally correct, and now when customers are really, really worried about if your kit is gonna fit in their application, and trust me, there will be lots of applications you are uncertain if it's going to fit perfectly with this turbo, this intake. That's a great tool for your customers to be able to actually bolt a turbo right on top and be like, yeah, this works perfect, send me one of those. So you could be uh, printing this off, selling it for 50 bucks, and in turn, you'd be getting a multi-thousand dollar order back out of it. That is the type of thinking that will make you a, a ton of money in this industry. A very wise person explained this pie chart to me. You can have any two from here but you can't have all three at once that's just how it works you can be good and fast but you won't be cheap you can be cheap and good but you won't be fast I mean that how true is that in this world of uh, paying people to do things what I think you're doing when you have the ingenuity to think of faster ways to do things I think that you're getting closer to offering all three of these at once I don't ever want your work to be cheap I want you to be expensive because you're better than everybody else but you will gain more and more customers and get your success much quicker if you can be all three of these as much as possible. So yeah, keep this in mind. That's what I think you're getting with this comment is uh, this person is getting themselves closer to be having all three, which is uh, really the, uh, the ultimate thing to achieve. Why not get a CNC and make the flanges too? A lot of flanges I do make here on my lathe, especially if they're round flanges, I'll make them on the lathe. Um, simple flanges that are maybe not for motorsport, but just in this commercial world that I deal with, I'll make it on a manual milling machine like this, no problem. The question, why don't you buy a CNC to make your own flanges? Uh, that might seem intuitive, like that's the way to go. And I'm not saying it's not, but there's just more to think about with this. Bringing in a CNC machine, no matter what, is going to bring in a heavy cost or at least a monthly payment. I can almost guarantee it'll have some kind of monthly payment attached to it. If I had to acquire the skills of programming a CNC machine, that's a full-time job. If you already have the understanding of CNC machine uh, work, and programming, then maybe you're more geared towards that. The great side to bringing other people flanges, you know, machine work basically, is you're giving other people money and that's improving your relationship with them. This whole industry is, is, is built upon making relationships with other people. That's so important because so many people have the other side of what you need. It's very similar to how I was borrowing a, a large sander to sand my manifolds, even up to this present day. Uh, from a shop that was local, and that shop has helped me in so many other ways, including bringing me tons of other work that, I ha that I've been able to make money on, and I even housed my shop in that shop for a few years when I was in between uh, shop locations. So I can't say it enough, it's so important and it's such a joy to make new connections with other people because it is all about connections. Where do you find the market to sell your manifolds? Is there a company or website that you sell it to? You've gotta be interested in the car. I had a Mazda RX-7, a second gen at home. The first thing that I did was log on to rx7club.com. I made an introduction post as a vendor. I listed my manifold, what I'm selling them for, and what makes them better. In my case, I was using a billet merge collector that was uh, not done in the industry at all at the time. Another thing I used was Facebook groups. That's a great asset now. Different types of people on each. You're probably going to find that people on Facebook Marketplace have less money than people on uh, an old school forum. Another way that I sold these products was through Instagram. It may have been the most effective. As I was posting my work on Instagram, just the work I was doing, so people, non-RX7 people were following me, liking the work, whatever else, uh, just somehow through that, RX7 guys were finding me. You've already got the content, throw it on Instagram. I, I guarantee you that will bring you many more clients. 
As far as selling products to other companies like to put on their website, yes, you can definitely do that. In the manifold building world, the hardest part for people trying to sell manifolds is that they're not easy to keep in stock. I used to sell Miata manifolds. I touched base with this guy named Brian Spears who ran Fab9 Tuning. Fab9 Tuning is a premier MX-5 Miata website. They sell the basically the best of everything. He's very knowledgeable. Even to this day, if I could produce turbo kits for him and keep him stocked, he would sell every single one of them and be asking me for more in no time. You should expect uh, the vendor to make at least $500 on an expensive turbo kit if you're gonna sell him that. There has to be margins in there, so I, as always, recommend keeping your price high. That helps you pay for things and just make more money. Please, how did you break into the industry? For us handy folk, the marketing is a hard part. I've already explained that you need to be somewhat dedicated to that car and that chassis. This is a guaranteed way to get work super easy. Go onto Facebook groups, you find a group for your car, you say, hi, I'd like to build manifolds in this space. It's not going to be hard at all for a car guy to want to give you his car in exchange for a manifold. So you could get somebody to give you their car for a week or two. You build them a manifold. You build your jig around that manifold. And then you build a manifold out of the jig that you just made and then you test that manifold on that car. You'll be giving your customer a manifold. You'll have a manifold now that you know fits and you'll have a jig. It's your choice what you charge them, but you can charge them just the cost of materials and, and then you weld it together and make it a manifold for them or you can just give it to them for free. You've got a foot in the door now. Now you can reproduce this kit as many times as you need to. What's very important to remember is that you're gonna have to ask what are the most common turbos that people want to run on this platform. The biggest and the smallest turbo that people are gonna run, what fits, anything else that gets in the way. After that, you put your kit together, you take photos, you do everything. Now you're ready to jump on Facebook groups, jump on a forum and say, hi, my name's What's His Face and I now sell manifolds. Once they realize you're a trustworthy vendor, that you offer good services, that you really care about your work, people will flock to you. I always refer to the RX-7 genre that I was in as a niche within a niche. Even though there's not that many guys necessarily out there looking to do this, only so many people are going to do what you're going to do. So there might be a lot of views on my videos about this subject and a lot of comments saying they want to do that, but the actual amount of people who will take the time to do all of these things is very few. You have very little competition to go ahead and make manifolds and make a ton of cash doing it. Okay, just read the first Let's part. Say I know how to do it and I got the tools but no extra money to build a test one, nor portfolio previous work. I have very little patience for anybody who says they can't. I believe every single person possesses a deep well of drive and ability. I believe you can do it. If you want it, you can have it, but it's not going to be easy. And I think a lot of these questions come to me because people are asking like, hey, how do I easily do this? There, there is no easy way to do it. I keep saying under a thousand. I, I would challenge that you could probably do this for $500. You need to buy a welder and a grinder. Those tools are very inexpensive. You're not buying quality today. You're gonna buy quality tomorrow on that. You do not need a lot of things. If you can't save a thousand dollars somehow, even if it takes a year to do it, then I don't see how you're going to succeed doing this because there will be many more struggles that come and confront you on it and you will have to overcome those too. Manifolds are an analogy. They're my reality, they are what I used, but they were just where I found a place to sink my teeth in and do it. I want you to think about what you focus on. What are the things that you love doing? Okay, so some of my story. Answering these questions makes me remember that I don't have all the answers. I just have my experience and, uh, and basically what I've read in a book. One of my first real professions that I got into was being a mechanic. So I was a diesel mechanic uh, for a dealership working on big Mack trucks and Volvo trucks. I knew I was mechanical, but I, I didn't really love the high production that uh, you kind of end up being in when you're a mechanic. It's, it's get work out good, fast, and cheap. I got an opportunity for my dream job, which was a, a machine shop in town intentionally small. There was just a few guys there and they are really, really smart and clever guys. They basically invented technology for customers. So customers would come with a problem and, and we would give them a solution. We'd make the whole thing in house. I hadn't taken machine shops since, since school. I knew nothing about it. I didn't know how to weld and they taught me everything. It was absolutely a fantastic place to learn. It completely shaped my life. When I talk about having quit my job a little too early, I always push people to wait a little bit longer because the things that I learned in a few years of being at this shop 
really did change my entire life and I can only imagine what five to 10 years of being there could have done and uh, how I could have started my own business after that with uh, this incredible wealth of knowledge. So. I worked there for a few years and what ended up happening was I got sick with Crohn's disease. It'd be, it'd just been something that had been uh, slightly in the background, never really caused me too much problem, but now it took over my life and I wasn't able to work. The long story short on having that is that it took me a long time to get diagnosed. And by the time I was diagnosed and on treatment and even just finding an effective treatment, uh, I was so past the point where, where I could get up in the morning and go to work every day. I was freshly married. I'd only been married about a year at this time to my wife and uh, I had to provide for us somehow. I really didn't know what to do and I can't express this enough. I was young and dumb. I, I just, I, I had really few skills to offer. I knew nothing about business. I wouldn't have been more than 25 at the time. What I ended up doing was quitting my job at this machine shop and starting work for myself. I had built an exhaust for a Mazda Miata, just a local guy. I thought, man, I love doing this. Uh, why can't I? With the very few dollars I had, bought a TIG welder and basically just did what I'm preaching to you in these videos to do is just start where you stand with what you have. And I just started doing work for people. I had my RX-7, I was doing mods to it constantly over the years. So I thought I'd pull it apart, build a manifold for it. That kind of got the whole thing going. Shortly after, I met another guy uh, in Toronto. He drove down, gave me an FD that was a third generation RX-7, and he allowed me to build something on it, gave him the manifold, just started the whole thing. This guy also ended up bringing me an incredible amount of work over the years. Uh, like I said, connections, they, they really are everything. Um, it was also a notable person in the RX-7 community, so he helped get my name around and uh, helped spread the word. Over the years, I was always battling my health and the work that I was able to do. Just when I'd be making progress on things, getting jobs in, my health would deteriorate, and I'd have a hard time being able to keep up with that. And that started opening my eyes to how hard business is, and, and really, once I learned the secret of success, which is just persistence, uh, it really dawned on me that I was uh, doing something cool and I had in the last few years made some waves uh, with, with the manifolds I had built. As I slowly got better and slowly got on treatment plans that worked better for me, allowed me to be out in the shop more, uh, I just kept building the business and kept making manifolds. They just kept falling into my lap. I, I can't say that enough. I worked for basically all of the notable uh, people in town. I worked for uh, TCP Magic, which is a huge, you know, epic thing in the RX-7 community. I built a manifold for a Red Bull Time Attack car for uh, somebody in Japan putting this car together. Four rotor, three rotor, I kind of just did it all. Like I bumped shoulders with what seemed like all of the people in the industry looking to spend money and wanting a really nice product at the end. So. I had met two friends through this RX-7 uh, get-together where we, uh, I drive my car 10 hours to North Carolina uh, to meet up with all these guys who want to go to this thing called Tail of the Dragon. It's, uh, it's like 217 turns and 11 miles of road. It's a total blast. It's an incredible time and they do it every year. I had met two people that are vendors in the RX-7 community and uh, we had just bumped shoulders occasionally. And what ended up uh, happening was that I met these guys and I realized that we all realized how like-minded we are and that we wanted to build products and uh, we just wanted to do something. We were ambitious and we wanted to use basically each other to help get it done. We designed a uh, business that started making the flanges. So those CNC flanges that I've been uh, talking about, those, we built those flanges for other people in the industry. Our problem was after we built that business for a year or two is that uh, we found that there was just a bit of a ceiling there. Uh, we weren't getting as many sales as we wanted to really make this thing work. So we had a lot of overhead. We had to buy a couple CNC machines to do it. We ended up getting together and developing a broccoli grinder. And this grinder is made of stainless steel. We used all the skill of machining stainless steel to be able to uh, make this awesome product that was a true problem solver in the cooking world. That product has since taken off and it's been uh, life-changing. I would have never met my two partners if I wasn't building manifolds like a slave in my garage between bathroom breaks. 
So what at the time seemed like the hardest time of my life was surviving and, and doing all this. And, and of course there was a time of thriving, don't get me wrong. Uh, eventually it did take off with Manifolds and I was able to make good money doing it, but, uh, but not when I met the guys. I guess that's the quick of it and why I'm so passionate about uh, saying that you can. I believe that I had every possible thing against me and there's lots that I haven't talked about. There's lots. And also all the shit you were dealing with and then your wife gets cancer and you're like, what the yeah, I know what a pain that's when I'm doing all this work, huh? I was able to prevail through and be able to basically make a name for myself out of nothing. And I believe you can because I've already seen it happen numerous times. Through my Instagram page, I was, uh, I think I was inspirational to a couple people and one person in particular reached out, called me, took in every piece of information he could get from me. And right now he's still in the RX-7 world building the manifolds that I was building and uh, he is now the new guy for it. Now he's making absolutely beautiful pieces of jewelry for RX-7s. Anybody who wants it can have it, but it will be hard. If you wanna read the long version of my story, I do have something written out on my website, gleesmanufacturing.com. Again, there's nothing to sell you on there. That's just my, my, my landing page, my homepage. Now, I was promising you some books to read. I want to make two suggestions for you. One is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. To say it's a life-changing book is an understatement. If you at all resonate with what I've been talking to you about here, that book will resonate deeply with you and it is about selling personal services. So I'm selling manifolds, doing fab. Uh, it's for anybody. It does, it's not at all about manifolds and fabrication. I didn't totally agree at the end where he was talking about uh, how wearing a hat will make your hair fall out. Uh, just, uh, it, sometimes it just falls out, I'll say that for sure. The second book is called Change Your Paradigm, Change Your Life by Bob Proctor. I cannot recommend this book enough. I love Bob Proctor. I wish he was near me. <laughs> if he, and I don't know if he's alive anymore either, but um, that's just recently anyways. Bob Proctor is very similar to other mentors I've had in my life. One of them was at this machine shop I was telling you I worked at. Every single word in that book is deep wisdom that should be followed and appreciated. If you're the guy that has left a comment uh, saying basically I can't, oh you need $80,000 in equipment type of I can't, this really is the book for you. Um, and I say that gently because uh, <laughs> I used to also be that guy until I read, until I changed my thinking. If anybody comes and asks me for wisdom, I always point them to those books and I'm almost unwilling to talk to them further until they've read those, they get that information, they understand it, now we can talk. Please leave a comment if you've checked those books out. Uh, I'd love it and I'd also love to hear other books that you've read too. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. What makes the struggle worth it? I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still getting there. What makes a struggle worth it is always the end result. <laughs> I know that sounds simple, but a manifold is a struggle to build. I mean, I, I really, Leandra can uh, attest to how not fun it was to build that manifold for camera and just, you know, bringing back old memories. But, uh, but no matter what, looking back at your work, oh, that's fantastic. It's the thing that gets you every time. You might not enjoy building it, but you love it so much at the end that you're ignorant enough to do it again and get yourself back into building again. To see people happy, to see people uh, surprised and pleased with your work, it doesn't get better than that. I love solving problems for people and that's why I love doing what I do now, more commercial type work rather than uh, working in the automotive industry. Ready for another question? Yeah. Why do you make YouTube videos? Well, I've tried numerous times to make YouTube videos over the years and haven't been able to do it. I've, it's been a deep want for a long time and I think a lot of people understand what I mean who, who kind of grew up watching YouTube videos. I love showing my work to people. I think it also helps bring in more work. It's fantastic, another fantastic uh, part of it. But uh, I'm also passionate about people. I mean, uh, people have always asked me about my journey and about my work and uh, I love being able to share that. But uh, I just like new hard things and I like uh, new creative outlets. So um, I've tried YouTube for many years and uh, was on and off, never really, uh, you can look back at my history, I never really got my teeth sunk into it properly. But uh, that is until I just decided to try it again. We uh, I hired Leandra. To do all the filming and editing and um, I made myself a promise that I was gonna try it hard for a year 
uh, with uh, nothing holding me back. I want to give you some people to follow on Instagram. Honestly, it was only on Instagram back in the day when I really learned what the ceiling of like what welts can look like uh, and, and, and kind of what the standard is for that. So please follow these fabricators. I, and I'm so sorry, I literally just scrolled through, found a couple greats and threw them on here. I know I'm missing enormous fabricators, but uh, start here and you will find your way. One of them is B&M, B&M Performance. They also do YouTube, you should check them out. They're constantly posting positioner videos. It's perfect. Uh, Unobtainium Welding, I mean, the absolute goat. I've already referred to him once in this video. Uh, he is the absolute goat slayer of titanium. It doesn't get better and he's a fantastic person. And uh, what's the greatest part about him? He's Canadian. TIG Aesthetics, you definitely need to follow TIG Aesthetics and Brad Harmer. They are, are deeply rooted in the community. Uh, weld Porn, you gotta follow Weld Porn. They post the best stuff and your goal is to get on their page. Dabs Wellington. I can't say enough about Dabs Wellington, and I'd love if you'd go and follow him because this guy broke over 250,000 followers on Instagram early days of posting welds on Instagram, and uh, somebody stole his account. He's since built it up again, but everybody needs to go and follow Dabs Wellington because the man has performed two miracles. Morgan Performance Fabrication. This guy is unbelievably good. He makes it look easy. And back in the day on Instagram, he was my arch nemesis and I like poking at him all the time. He's a fantastic guy. I am girl welder. She does amazing titanium welding and she makes completely badass titanium roses. You gotta check those out. It's a whole nother product that she's basically designed and built just like manifolds and she sells a out of them. M. Furick, Michael Furick, he makes welding cups. He's a legend in the industry for making welding cups. He's a staple, you have to follow him. Rampage Fab of Design, you gotta follow Rampage Fab. He's unbelievable, does a lot of GTR stuff. Follow these guys, they make it look easy and they will also give you lots of inspiration. Look around in their photos, look at what they're using, look at their welds, look at everything. Well, that is it. I know this has been a long chatty video. I hope you made it to the end. If you did, I hope you read those books, check them out, leave a comment. I'd love to hear your opinions of that. Otherwise, thanks for checking this out and I'll see you on the next one.